Well, as all the women here will probably agree with me, it is still a man's world. I mean, it's a hundred years since Emily Pank has tied herself to the railways. We still don't have equal pay. We're getting, what is it now, I think 75 pence in the pound. We're still getting concussion hitting our head on the glass ceiling and we're supposed to clean it while we're up there. <laughs> um, so I do think that any woman who calls herself a post-feminist has kept her wonder bra and burned her brains because we have a long way to go. But I also think that women are each other's human wonder bras, uplifting, supportive and making each other look bigger and better. Um, I think that's true. And you know, while we talk about how women in the West, how difficult it is for us and all the battles we're fighting, imagine what it's like for women in the developing world where women are fed last, fed least. I mean, you know all the horrible statistics of how when the, the, if the mother dies and one woman dies every minute in childbirth in the developing world, the girls are taken out of school, put into prostitution or domestic service. It is a man's world. And I think it's up to us to help our less fortunate sisters, which is how I got involved with PLAN. There is a lot, you know, we write it, we see it a lot about the, the fear for younger women, especially mm. in the digital era and, oh, and what's yeah. going on. Do you, do you share that or do you feel like we sort of patronise the youth and worry about them too much? Oh no, I think young women have to, I like the mentoring system, which should all, all we feisty older feminists should take on younger women and encourage them to be brave and strong and to wear a bulletproof bra. Because as, any, as we all know, if a woman puts her head above the parapet, she's going to cop a lot of flack, much more than a male would. Why as you know from the Twitter abuse. Because certain Neanderthal men are nervous about women getting more power, of course. Has so, it affected you though? Do you, do you, I mean, you, you're incredibly funny and, and I don't wish to psychoanalyse you. You're, you're doing that on your own, you say, in your books. But um, you seem like nothing could could touch the sides, or is that not Well, I the think case? growing up in Australia where the men are a tad Neanderthal, look what happened to Julia Gillard, mm -hmm. you do learn to be a bit of a backroom, you know, brawler. There's a sort of tone that is associated mm -hmm. with feminism or women's rights, and it's, it's something I've obviously tried at, at Telegraph to, you know, or when I'm presenting women's art, whatever, to try and inject a bit of fun. Exactly. And a bit of life, which yeah. obviously Cathy very much stands for. <laughs> um, but. Do you think that's the off-putting factor? Right. Well, I, I think you, I always try and use humour to, to sugarcoat any message. I think that's much more effective. And also, women are funny. When you go on a girls' night out, do you not have to be hospitalised from hilarity? <laughs> and there's a great male myth that women aren't funny. You hear that from men all the time. But I think men are just terrified what it is we're being funny about. I think they presume <laughs> we spend the entire time talking about the length of their members, which, boys, is not true. Because we also talk about the width, you know, which after childhood is so much more important. <laughs> um, but, you know, like I, when I got really angry when I was, um, had small children and I, and I was trying to, you know, kid, working mothers, kid and career juggling. I mean, we could be, we juggle so well we could be in the Moscow State Circus. And I used to say to my husband all the time, you've got to help me more around the house. And he's like, well, I'd like to help, but I'm a man and I can't multitask. Now, what a biological cop-out. Can you imagine any man having any trouble multitasking at, say, an orgy? He would have no trouble at that time. It would all be going on. So you went on a trip, which is, a, you know, to Brazil. Um, oh, yeah. And we're going to talk about that because mm. most people don't get to go and see what we read about yeah. in the developing world. And you went with Plan, and in, I know you were keen to see what was actually happening on the ground. Um, mm. A big author trip, as I understand it. Yeah. Why don't you just, if you can, paint a bit of an image of what you saw because it's very hard for us to to sort of visualise. Yeah. Well, you know, we give we give money to charities. You always think, is it where's it going? What's happening to it? So I wanted to see what Plan actually do and why I'm a big supporter is that it's a very hands-on charity and it helps young women and it helps girls and and mothers. Um, and the basic things, contraception, education, nutrition. And I saw it firsthand. The women are just, they play ovarian roulette. And of course, once they get pregnant, their lives are over. They drop out of school, as their mothers did, and this just goes on and on and on. And I was so heartbroken to see the loss of potential. It's, Brazil's like a giant missing persons bureau, and the people that are missing are the, are the, you know, the, the, are the girls. Their potential is once they're pregnant, it's just over. And the, some of these girls, they start being exploited sexually at four, five, six. I mean, it was just so, so brutal. And even the little villages I saw outside, um, up in San Luis, uh, the girls were being raped on the way to school. So what PLAN does, and what PLAN is just so practical, 
as they were being raped on the way to school in the other village, they just built a school in their village. They just didn't have to run that, the risk of being raped on the way. So um, they just basically sneak contraception to the women who come secretly. They can't tell their husbands. So they get access to contraception. They get um, information on nutrition, how to feed themselves and feed their families. And they get education. And if you can educate a girl, of course, she won't get pregnant. She will have a more chance of getting a better job and of lifting the family up out of poverty. It's a no-brainer. So Plan was an absolute lifeline. I was really, really impressed. What, what most surprised you about the trip? Um, the, the women are extraordinary. I mean, they've got, we've got, an, you know, we have all our worries here in, in, in the developed world, but there they have absolutely nothing. And yet the women, they're, they're so resourceful. They keep everything clean. They try and look after their children, braid their hair, whatever. They're desperate for them to go to school. And plan, you know, enable them, give them the help that they need to actually to save themselves and save their, their daughters. So it's, it's a brilliant charity. I'm totally 100% behind it. Did it... Did it have a long-lasting effect on you? I mean, a trip like that is not something you get to do yeah. regularly. It's, it's well, that's why I'm an ambassador for PLAN. But also, I was so shocked. I'd never really seen poverty like that. So I did the only thing a girl can do. I went straight back to Rio and checked into the Copacabana and drank... <laughs> what do you call those drinks? Capi what are they called? Capitano. 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 Yeah, I just... The one you can't say. Mainline them for days, you know. <laughs> So it, it really shocked me to the core. But I mean, we're talking about Brazil right now. I know yeah. you went a couple of years ago, but the World Cup's there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's crazy, right? It's crazy. You can have, it's crazy. You can have such money and, and these sort of mm -hmm. teenage millionaires running around on a football pitch and, mm -hmm. and such a different situation. Well, it's a very patriarchal society. So even, even in these, the slums that I went to, the favelas, it, the, it, when the boys get up in the morning, they're allowed to sleep in. The girls get up and make the breakfast. When they get home from school, um, you know, the girls are allowed to go to school. They, the girls have to help prepare the food, and it's all about looking after the boys. And, of course, football is, is predominantly male sport, so it, didn't, it doesn't surprise me. But it, the dichotomy is shocking, yeah. Well, you've said it. I also, I went out with a footballer, and they treat girls just like footballs. They play footsie, make a pass, and drop you as soon as they've scored. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know I'm not dating a footballer. Yeah, don't. <laughs> um, do you do anything to encourage your daughter into the line of feminism? Because, I mean, I think my girl could be a firebrand, but yeah. anything I say to her now, she will do the complete opposite. I just kept talking about feminism all the time, pointing things out whenever we were watching things. Then I got her into watch, to watch Mad Men, you know, which, and that, that was such an eye-opener for her. Because a lot of younger women have all the benefits of feminism, but none of the battle scars. You know, and they don't realise how, how hard won our freedoms are, and also how easily they could be lost. So you just keep talking, just keep rabbiting on. And it does, even though they go, oh, and they roll their eyes and carry on, it does sort of sink in. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, yeah, so just be, a mo I, I'm the mouth from the south, but just, yeah, be a motor mouth. <laughs> yeah. The teenage daughters, you know, are God's punishment for having sex in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned your girlfriend before. Yeah. Having work. Some of them. Oh, yeah. With their lips coming towards oh, you. Oh, yeah. From a few miles away. Yeah. Is that, is that odd as you get older that, that, that women around you, I mean, if you're, because not everyone, you know, lots of my friends go, oh, I'm not a feminist, but that's their favourite beginning. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I want equal pay. But I <laughs> yeah. want this, but, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. but. Um, but is that, is it hard to sort of resist, not judgment, but is it hard to, to see them doing things which you know maybe they, sh they wouldn't be doing if they hadn't been so influenced in a bad yeah. way by things that aren't Well, I just them. tell them things like, you know, I have a friend who's a paediatrician in LA, and he said to me that in the, in the affluent areas, the babies were not hitting their um, developmental milestones, and they couldn't work out what was going on. And then I thought, I know what's going on. It's the Botox. Because you only have a baby, and the baby's lying in the cot, and you go, I love you, little bummy, little oh, And the baby goes, eh, and you go, eh. If the woman's about up, she's going, I love you. <laughs> and the baby's going, yeah, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And I think that's what's happening. <laughs> so, yeah, I just think we, if we just 
saw more women who looked like us, looked yeah. like looked normal with wrinkles. I always say to men, you know, read between my lines. It's all there. <laughs> the books, the babies, the hours of fun loving fellatio. You know, why? Yeah. Why can't we see women who look normal? In fact, I, I'm threatening to have a campaign at the BBC where all the women over 50, we're going to go down to Broadcasting House and we're going to wear our leopard skin and, and we're going to drink cocktails outside and stick our HRT patches all over the window <laughs> and just refuse to pay our full licence, you know, BBC, what's it called, the licence fee? You know, we'll pay 20% of it. Or no, less, it's probably about 8% of, of women who look like us on TV until we actually see real women. And the more we see real women, the more women will think, well, it's okay to look like that. So Danny Cohen at the BBC has said that... This is his, the BBC his, One controller. Yeah, that he, he's going to have a token woman on each comedy panel show. But we don't really want that either. Why can't we have our own show? Um, I just think our humour is different. We don't tell set jokes. It's more, it's more uh, cathartic and confessional. Nice. I mean, when women are together, you boys don't know. We strip off to our emotional underwear in 3.6 seconds, and it's a psychological strip tease that reveals all. Women are very candid together, in a way that men never would be. So, and it's, it's very funny, but it's not sort of one-liner-itis. It's just, it's a little bit more quirky and tangential. Back to teenage daughters, I have two of my own. Um, I noticed slippage in their confidence. If I compare yeah. myself to mm. them, I didn't worry too much about my appearance. I didn't worry mm. about being kilos overweight and I worry that they're obsessed with their appearance, they're obsessed with projecting their image mm. and they're not concentrating on the important things in life, mm. their studies, their mm -hmm. relationships and they're both good mm. schools, universities, why? Do you have an explanation? Well I think we've all been lulled into a false sense of security that we, we are treated as equals in, in Britain because even the research they did in the media about how women are represented in newspapers. I'm sure not the Telegraph, because they're supporting this event, so they're obviously enlightened. But 78% of bylines on the front pages of newspapers are by men, and 84% of the content on front pages is a, it's about men. And in photos, if they show a man on the front pages of, this is the, you know, the media. Yeah, the women yeah. in journalism. If they show a man on the front page of a newspaper, he will be either seen in, in a powerful position in a suit or in jogging gear, looking manly. If they not, show not since Operation U Tree. <laughs> oh well, yeah, maybe that's the one exception. <laughs> but if they show a woman in power, like Andrea Merkel or Clinton, they invariably show or Gillard. They show a falling over or pulling a funny face, or looking mm. weird. The only women they show on the front pages of newspapers regularly who look okay are all women who are silent in real life. The Queen, Kate Middleton, and Camilla. They're not allowed to have an opinion. And they're the women we see on, the, on our newspapers. So just, if you think about that drip feed constantly that the women, have, yeah, it, it does affect you and it's corrosive. I just think we just need to get stroppy and, and angry and take, go back to the barricades. That's my, what I think we should but do. But you do your anger with such humour. Well, as women do. If you but not, not all women do. There are, there are you know, is it, if I can say something that's maybe slightly controversial, but. A lot of women who com complain about being poorly treated online themselves, they dole out stuff that they wouldn't accept the other way on sometimes, which I just wondered what you thought of that. I mean, for instance, I'll give you a really benign example. The other day, during the Wimbledon final, I don't know if you watched it, I was massively enjoying it. And Jenny Murray, I present women down from time to time, did a tweet that if she had said, a man had said about a woman, by God. What did she say? She said, I am really, really distracted by Djokovic's crotch. <laughs> well, do you know what? And what's your reaction? No, no, seriously. What is your reaction to that? Because then loads of girls went, oh my God, me too. It looks so big. Do you know what? <laughs> I would say it's our turn. We have had Five. centuries centuries of objectification and sexism. If we can't blow the odd little raspberry back now, I think we're allowed a little leeway in that department. I feel fully like I'm allowed now, Cathy. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. but I'm just saying it's interesting. It's it sort of, some people say, I don't think it's ever going to be redressed the other way on for time reasons, for the amount of years, as you say. Yeah. But I thought that was an interesting... Because it's still, it's still kind of radical for women to admit that we like sex and that we find men Hugely. sexy. Yeah. You know, in some countries, that's illegal. So I think that's okay to stir it up a little bit, be a bit mischievous, definitely. And with Djokovic girls, we aren't making small talk. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Although, I will add, boys, the one place where size does count with a man is the big throbbing organ here. That's, don't you think, girls? A man with a high IQ what? is what really excites us.
<laughs> I think on that note, please join me in thanking Catherine.